I have the pleasure of doing the last presentation with my colleague Brian Pauze. And we're going to be talking about Yale external app pilots that we are conducting. And, um, and yeah. So, just to kind of give a little bit of background, um, Lucas kind of touched upon it earlier. Um, we moved from Sakai, which was called Classes V2, over to Canvas. Um, this is the second full academic year that we have been on Canvas as a university. And one of the reasons why we moved to Canvas is because of its ability um, to be extended and have, um, it provides the framework so that third party vendors and developers can develop tools that can plug into Canvas and extend the function, the core functionality of Canvas beyond what it can do. Um, there are definitely different ways that tools can be installed within Canvas. It can be installed kind of globally so that all courses within Canvas can use the tool. It can be installed at a school level, so if a professional school buys a tool that's specific to their group, it can be installed just for that school. And it's also, we also have the ability to install tools at the course level, um, which may be for something that is license-based and we only have a, a small number of licenses, so it would get installed only on a course-by-course -course basis. Um, any tool that we do install into Canvas must be vetted um, to ensure that it is accessible and to ensure that any student data that might be passed through it or to it is protected and secure. Um, currently, we are in the middle of several pilots, which I'm going to go into details, but I just kind of listed them out here. And we do have a few successful pilots that we will talk about as well. But I'm just going to jump right on in. Uh, the first one is Gradescope, which Natalia described very well this morning, so I won't go into too much detail, but in case you came in late and happened to miss that session, um, it is a tool that is used for grading. Um, it, is, it was built primarily to assist with grading of paper materials like worksheets and things that faculty have created. Um, and what happens is the instructor will take their a clean version of their homework assignment scan it in and they can identify within that paper an outline of where they expect students to be writing in their answers and based on where those markings are indicated when the student submissions are scanned in Gradescope will split up the student submissions based on where you have identified within your outline where question one would appear versus question two and so on and so forth. Um, with that, once they're scanned in there, the instructors have the ability to set up rubrics um, to determine um, how many points they're going to add or subtract uh, based on uh, different criteria that the students have submitted in their answers. And those rubrics are shared amongst multiple graders. So if you have a bunch of teaching fellows that are supporting you, they can all see how it's scored. And, um, and it will also, for those questions that can be auto-scored, it will use those and auto-score all the answers. The student, individual students, to, to scan their own papers and submit that, or does it have to be something where you? Nope, there is definitely an option for student, allowing students to do it, or you can collect all the papers and you can scan them as the instructor. Um, one of the great benefits to doing this, uh, doing your grading through this tool, is you will be able to see statistics on your normally just handed in papers statistics that you wouldn't normally probably get because you're just sifting through papers. So that's another added benefit to using Gradescope. Another one of our continuing pilots is Notebull, which is a discussion board tool, which is a little bit more enhanced than what is available in Canvas um, inherently. Um, Notebull has two distinct features. The first feature is called the Bulletin. And the bulletin is just a tool that is provided in your course navigation bar. And it is typically used as, a, as an FAQ area where students can just post general questions and students and instructors can reply to those. Um, instructors do have the ability to post and pin certain questions or comments that they want to appear at the very top. So there is that ability to pin things. And there also is added functionality to allow students to post anonymously to the bulletin board. This is truly anonymous. Instructors and students cannot tell who posted it. So it allows students to maybe feel a little bit more comfortable about asking a question that they might feel could get them made fun of if their name was attached to it or, or, um, or otherwise they might just not ask it because they're afraid of having their name attached to it. Um, so there is the ability to post, or you can post with your name. It's optional. Whoever's posting can choose whether or not they're anonymous or not. 
Um, additionally, there is the functionality that allows people to like comments. So students can like each other's answers. But the benefit here is that instructors can also like them. And when an instructor likes them, it puts a little green indicator next to it to say the instructor has endorsed this answer. So that can be super helpful if you want to provide a, you know, a community feeling where students can answer each other's, but you also want to be able to say, but this is really the right answer and this is what you should go by. So that added feature is helpful for that. Um, the other half of Notebull is it allows you to have graded assignments. Essentially, the assignments look very similar to the discussion board, but it does provide a column in the gradebook and you can grade based on these. Um, right now, I'm looking at a student view of the assignment here. And one of the great things about this tool is the instructors can set requirements for the discussion boards. And those requirements could mean that you are saying you must post at least one original post and you must comment on at least two others. And with those requirements, the students can easily see what the requirements are and whether or not they've met those. So you can see in this one, they have submitted a, an original post, which meets that criteria, but they have only submitted one comment to another student, and they're not quite there yet. So students can easily see whether or not they have fully completed their assignment. On the instructor view, the instructors do get this little dashboard where they get a summary of what has been happening within this discussion. The summary includes a count and tally of how many original posts the students have made, how many comments they've made to other students, and if you do have requirements, it will indicate for you whether or not that student has met your requirement. Additionally, through this tool, if you click on that little magnifying glass for a student, it will open up a little view so that you can see all the posts for that individual student. So it quickly takes you directly to the post for that student. And it does have indicators for looking for their original post versus looking for comments. So you can flip in between those on that view. The next of our continuing pilots is a tool called PlayPosit, which is a tool that overlays on top of videos to allow you to put uh, self-quizzing and self-check questions on top of your video. The benefit to this tool is it does pause the video at that moment and it will not allow the students to move beyond that point until they have completed the question. So this is a way to ensure that students are getting through to the end of the video and actually watching it and you can actually gauge how much they've understood while doing it. There are multiple different question types. Um, there are, there's the ability to insert web pages as well. And you can also just put reflective pauses, like if you want to say, in the next three minutes, be sure to look out for X, Y, Z. You can just kind of stop them and make them just read that really fast before they move on. So there's a lot of options for using that tool. Um, another one of our continuing pilots is Turnitin. And Turnitin is a tool that allows you to um, evaluate the originality of a submission by a student. Um, uh, when you as an instructor uh, create an assignment, you do have the option whether or not you want to turn on this tool or not. And if you do turn it on for a, an assignment, when you go into your gradebook area, each student will receive a little score checker and it will have a color indicating how much of the uh, submission is original and not. If you click on that indicator, it will take you directly to the report where it will show you a numerical grade of how well that, um, that submission matches against things. And you also do have filtering options to say, if you see something that is in quotes, ignore that because I'm assuming that's well cited. So you do have some flexibility in determining what um, is included within that score. One of our completed pilots is VoiceThread. VoiceThread we are moving forward with. Um, VoiceThread is another sort of discussion type tool that allows you as the instructor to create, they call them voice threads, and you put in media artifacts. It can be a picture, it can be a video, you can put up a PowerPoint or a document. And when the students open up that artifact, they get the ability to provide comments on that item. Those comments can be text comments. They can record their voice speaking the comments. Um, and if they don't have a microphone for their computer, they can actually use their phone to call in the comment. Um, or they can use their webcam and they can record themselves with video to, to post comments. Um, there are other multiple ways of using this, but I'm 
rapidly eating through our time and want to make sure that we have time for Brian's. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm just going to talk about uh, just two additional successful pilots. Um, the first one you're probably familiar with since we've been using it today is uh, Poll Everywhere. Um, and so we started, we had traditionally supported um, a system called Turning Point, which maybe you're familiar with. It used physical clickers um, and we wanted to kind of relook at the polling landscape uh, and see what was available. Um, and so we kind of tested Poll Everywhere, quickly rose to be kind of the prominent one we wanted to look at. Um, and so w among many advantages that, that we find are the, extend, uh, the extended list of question types. Um, so today you've seen multiple choice being used, but um, because students can use their laptop, a mobile device, uh, respond via text message, um, you can have free response, you can have Q&A, um, you can do clickable images, so see heat maps on an image where students are touching. Um, you can do surveys, so you can bundle questions together, have students answer a number of questions at the same time. Uh, ranked order, so if you want to give them a number of choices, they can put them in their order of preference, and then it takes all that information and gives you, you know, a top five, top ten list um, of all the options. Um, and then the ability to upvote. So I don't know if you're familiar with the kind of the Reddit style upvoting. Uh, you can ask students questions and then they have the ability to upvote other people's responses. Um, so it's a good way to get, get an idea of what's the most um, you know, popular response, pressing question, um, et cetera. Uh, and so in terms of the, the, uh, the Canvas uh, integration, um, that's mostly through the gradebook. So there's a very easy course roster import. Um, so you would just log into your Poll Everywhere account, sync your course, it brings all your students in. Um, no licensing on the student side, which is something that we, that we, uh, we liked, so their barrier to entry is very low. Um, and then if you choose to grade your questions, you can export those grades back into the gradebook. Um, but you're also able to run reports on all your questions, and if you're using the Canvas integration, you can track overall student participation for um, any, of your, any of your questions, a series of questions. Um, at the end of the semester, you could take all your polls, uh, run a report on it, and then just see every student's overall participation for the entire course. Oh, and um, so just a couple screenshots here. Uh, we have a number of report types, so you can get a lot of information out of it, download them as CSVs, a lot of different ways to visualize that. And then just a little example of the connecting to the LMS, you just select what course you want to use and it imports that course roster. Um, so another thing that we liked, um, flexible presentation types. So it can integrate with PowerPoint, Keynote, Google Slides um, through an extension in Chrome. Um, but you can also just present directly from the website. So if you don't, uh, if you don't use PowerPoint or Keynote um, in the, in your class, um, you can just bring up a poll very easily via the website, go full screen, and it's exactly the same experience as looking through, um, through the integration. So you can also create your polls um, on the website. So if you're you know, away from your computer or not working on your presentation and you think of a great question, you can create the question um, you know, via a browser or on your mobile device, and then it's very easy to insert that into your presentation. Um, so as we saw today, you can create open polls for immediate access. So if you're not interested in tracking student participation on a per-student basis, you can make polls that are open to everyone, which is what we've been using today. So all they have to do is go to that response URL and, um, and they're right in, they can answer the questions. Um, and then as I mentioned, they can respond via mobile devices, web page, text message. Um, and then just a couple examples here. Uh, you just insert the activity, and this is on a Mac, it looks a little different on PC, of course, um, but then the slides just go right into your presentation. Um, and so just moving on to, to the next, um, next successful pilot uh, is Zoom, um, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. Uh, we don't have a poll for it, but how many people use Zoom? Show of hands. Yes, I'd imagine a lot of people. Um, but if you don't, uh, so this is an ITS supported resource, uh, you can go to yale.zoom.us and log in and you will get your pro account. Um, it's a very handy resource. Um, so the ways that we see it being used in terms of courses, remote collaboration, 
Um, it allows for screen sharing, uh, polling, uh, interactive whiteboarding, um, if you're doing like online meetings. Uh, bringing in guest speakers is kind of where we've seen a lot of the main use. That's very easy, very high quality way to bring in remote speakers into a course. You can just do it from your laptop. Um, no more really needing to go to a room specifically kitted out with video conferencing equipment. Um, online office hours, if you want to offer uh, times for students to come to, to meet with you, but not in person, that's great for that. Uh, synchronous online course sessions, so for our online courses, we see a lot of use in that. And just good old fashioned online meetings, very handy. Um, but the, the integration in Canvas um, allows you to schedule meetings directly through Canvas. So this is the instructor view, you would go to the Zoom sec section, and this is already, I believe, in everybody's Canvas course, you just have to unhide it in your navigation. Um, you can just schedule a new meeting and it'll show you all the meetings that you have scheduled. Um, and then as far as the student view, when they go in and look in Zoom, they just see all the meetings, they see a join button, they see when the meeting is supposed to be hosted. Uh, it can be their kind of like one-stop repository for all their course Zoom sessions. Uh, there's gonna be a coming um, improved integration in Canvas, which will then sync that with their, uh, their Canvas calendar. So they'll be able to see that uh, in a calendar view as well. So that kind of summarizes what's been going on. Um, and just to let you know things that are coming. So for the fall, we are starting to evaluate Respondus Lockdown Browser, which is a separate browser that can be installed on student machines that works in uh, coordination with Canvas quizzing. So instructors can create secure quizzing that once the student clicks on it and opens it, it will open up in this browser that will either restrict them completely from accessing anything on the internet, or you can actually determine that certain specific websites are okay for them to visit, but only those. Um, and it will also prevent them from being able to access other resources on their computer, and it will also prevent them from copying and pasting off of your quiz. So it does have a lot of controls for that. The other integration that we're looking into is an integration with CoursePress, which will basically allow it so that your, if you're using CoursePress blogging, it will insert a link for your CoursePress site in Canvas. And the Canvas roster will actually control and manage who has access to your CoursePress blog. Um, Additionally, we're starting to investigate the possibility of integration with Office 365 and an integration with Qualtrics. So we're, we're starting to, to look at those. Um, but just so you are aware, if you don't already know, we have a page on our website which gives you a quick status check on any external tools that are currently installed in or in the process of being vetted for installation into Canvas. And when you go to this website um, listed at the top here, you will need to log in with your uh, Yale Nut ID. And when you go in there, you'll be able to see the list of what's in there and you'll see the little colorful indicator showing where it is within the process. And if you see an item that says that's installed or, or um, or something that you're interested in using, if you click on that tool, it will take you to a page that will show you how to get started, and that may mean filling out a form and, and requesting access. But you can go to this site and see what is going on in terms of our external app status. If you are interested in a tool and would like us to start looking at it and helping get it installed, the process does take a little bit of time because we need to do these checks. So if you're looking for something for the fall, we have deadlines of March 1st for fall, so we've kind of missed that one for right now. For spring, we have deadline of October, and for summer, we have an, a deadline of November. And when you fill out the form, which is linked here, um, it will send us a little notice to let us know what you're looking at, and then we will schedule a consultation with you to discuss what the next steps are and how to get started with that. Um, and so, just to kind of round out this presentation, would love to hear if you are interested in any of the apps that we've talked about here today. Um, I don't think we need to do anything else. Oh, oh great. Perfect. And we do have information that we have over in the little resource fair area, which is just off here to your right. Um, and we will have the presenters over there talking about the things that they have talked about today. They will be at the tables here as well. And we strongly encourage you to come over and talk to everyone, pick up some of the papers that we have around that give you more information about what we're, what we're doing. Um, 
So that kind of wraps up this segment of our lightning talks. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone who helped here setting up, um, Julie and Kim for setting up all the food, and Lucas for, for starting us off here, and particularly to the team that helped coordinate this, the committee which included Patrick um, O'Brien, uh, Brian Pauze, um, Matt Reynolds, and uh, Claire Ancawi, and Christine Costantino, as always, and thank you so much to Broadcast for being here to help record it and make this so that we can make it more broadly available.